I, I promised so many people I'd record today so that they could see it later. I'll guess I'll have to tag on the beginning at the end. Um, so I was saying is for Tulsa and Oklahoma County, you, you they have the luxury of getting cases 30 days out to read the information. Um, um, but it's that's really not going to work um, without the technology and the staff person to help do that everywhere else. So everywhere else, um, either they kind of do it all at once. So you're not really you don't see the case file or hear the report till you get to the meeting. Um, some people do individual assignments, like, okay, we've got, I don't know, say five people in the meeting and 25 cases to go over. So everybody's gonna write recommendations on five cases. Some people have just the chair or just another individual write the recommendation. Um, I certainly prefer that, that people spread it out just so it's, you know, you've got more of a, broad perspective. Um, and again, I'm not saying there's necessarily a right or wrong way about that, but that um, we should certainly keep that in mind or think about how you do it and know that there is other ways. Um, all right, reviewing the case file. Kim, I think this starts you, am I correct? I think so, yeah. Can everybody hear right. me okay? Yes. Good. Good morning, everybody. It's exciting to see how many people turned out. So um, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide because I think it's probably one thing that probably every county does, regardless of where you are, is looking pretty closely at the court file. And um, we may go about that different ways, but I think there are certain things that are really essential and i'll talk a little bit more about why but i want to preface preface this slide with kind of the underarching theme of what i'm going to be talking about which is that in order for parbs recommendations to be useful they have to be relevant um, they have to fit within the scope of what the court is going to be looking at that particular day. And I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a moment. But some things that I think are crucial for every card member to understand is the history of the case. What brought the children into uh, the attention of the state? The petition is obviously a wonderful place to start. Keep in mind that petitions can be amended throughout the life of the case. You may have more than one petition on file because it was amended. So you're always going to want to look for um, any subsequent petitions to the original because those will normally clarify things like paternity, potentially ICWA status. They'll also maybe clarify any allegations throughout the case. So it's important to note, start with the petition and note that there could be more than one. So keep a lookout for those. Um, Initial DHS reports help you with the history, but if you don't have access to any of the initial reports in the case for some reason, obviously the most current report in the case should be able to provide you with enough information to help you start uh, moving forward because I think a very important part of our recommendations and writing recommendations is knowing that as a part member, you are reviewing that case at that moment in time. You are not going to be able to go back and solve what you see as prior errors. That's not that's not the point of our, our PAR recommendations. They're not supposed to, uh, you know, go back and say, well, you should have done this or we should have done that or why haven't we done that? It's to propose solutions moving forward. So prior court reports, or any prior report is going to give you history, and that's great. But if you don't have access to that, again, focus on the most current information. Um, if CASA is involved in the case, CASA should be writing reports for every court hearing. Um, if they are not, I strongly encourage you to reach out to the CASA volunteer. Um, if you ever need help getting in touch with a CASA representative on your case, uh, your local CASA board should be able to assist you, but if you don't have contact information for your local CASA board, you can always contact Keith or myself. Um, Christina, we will be able to assist you with getting that information. We work with CASA pretty closely across the state. Um, and I want to, can I say the same about DHS as well? If you if you don't feel like you have a very good relationship with child welfare, um, reach out, reach out to me. Um, 
And if you're talking to the wrong person, please don't be the only contact the uh, secretary at child welfare. Um, I, I really would like it to be the district director level at least knows who, who you are as a board. Anyway, there you go. Court orders um, are a little trickier because I know sometimes they can intimidate people, but court orders are very important because I'm going to sneeze, sorry, <laughs> I can feel that coming up. Court orders are going to help you as a PARB member, particularly when you are looking at progress in the case. I, I mentioned this in my new member training and I love to mention it again when we're talking about writing recommendations because it is crucial, crucial, crucial for our PALP volunteers to understand that the law does not require completion of the treatment plan before children can return home. That is not what the law says. The law says that the parent must make substantial progress in correcting the conditions that brought the children into custody. So court orders, especially your adjudication order, are always and should always tell you the conditions the court found. Okay, as a part board, it's very, very crucial for you to understand when you're reviewing a case, what are the problems the court has told the parents you need to fix before the children can return home? Okay, the adjudication order is going to let you know what problems the court found. OK, and then when you're reviewing the treatment plans, which is another item on these um, court documents that are crucial to look at, you should always have a treatment plan for each parent and you should always have treatment plan for each child. And if you're not seeing a treatment plan for each child in your county, that's definitely something you can consider uh, pointing out in your recommendation because those treatment plans should be tailored to fix the problem that the court found. And so reviewing these things in conjunction is important. Looking at the court orders to determine what the problems were, looking at the dispositional order to determine what the treatment plan is, and does it relate to the problems that the court found, okay? Then in your subsequent reviews, you'll be looking at not just hey has mom gone to substance abuse treatment has mom taken uas that's important but the treatment plan is a guide the treatment plan is a guide it it's essentially the social work part of the case it says hey we think if we send you to these services it's going to help you fix the problem but I use this example all the time. You all would agree that there are people that smoke that stop smoking without ever doing a lick of treatment. They don't use patches. They don't go to counseling. They don't do anything. They just stop. And then there are those individuals that no matter what, no matter how many patches you give them, no matter how much counseling you put them in, they won't stop smoking. So treatment plans are a guide. A parent can correct the conditions without ever completing a, anything on their treatment plan. Is it hard? Yes. Is it possible? Yes. So the treatment plan is a guide. What part members should be evaluating is the evidence that is presented generally through DHS about the progress parents have made. So if you have a parent, a child that was removed because of marijuana, and the parent has taken 30 clean UAs, their house is now organized and cleaner. The children are going to school on time. They're participating well in visits. Even if mom and dad didn't go to treatment for substance abuse, is it possible that parents corrected the condition of substance abuse, smoking marijuana? Yes, it's possible. So looking at court orders and looking at treatment plans will help you as PARB members understand what the problem is, what we laid out to help them fix it, and then what progress they're making toward correcting that problem. So those are the things that if you have access to, I strongly recommend you review. Um, and if you don't have access to them, I think it's a great question. Uh, Keith can help you maybe uh, work with your local chair uh, to work with your local court system to make sure those things are accessible to you because you do have every right under statute to review them. Okay, Keith, I think I can move on to the next one. I don't know about it. Okay, so I mentioned this when we first started. Um, 
It's also very crucial as a PARD member for you to understand what type of hearing your case is going to be set for. And there are different types of hearings within the context of these deprived cases. The most obvious place to determine what type of hearing it is, is through the court docket. Um, your chairs usually should, hopefully, if not, again, maybe something we can help with, have access or get a copy of the court's docket to help them know what cases to pull for review. And maybe they're just getting it that day. Maybe they're getting it a week in advance. I know it's different for every court. But hopefully your chair will be able to have a copy of the docket, which will help you understand what that case is set for. And here's why. In the simplest terms, at each hearing, the court is limited in scope to what decisions they can make, okay? And I'm gonna give you the most, the easiest example I can give you. At a permanency hearing, the court is gonna be determining the permanency plan for that child. They're gonna be looking at whether adoption, guardianship, uh, return home, or planned alternative placement is the goal for the next phase of the case. Courts are bound not to make decisions about issues that are not currently before them and parties have not put on notice for. So let's say you're at a permanency hearing, only a permanency hearing, and parents, mom's attorney shows up and says, judge, we want to talk about visitation. Mom, I filed this motion right before court. The court is, uh, mom is requesting that visitation be increased. Is it appropriate for the judge to make a decision about that motion at that hearing? No, it's not because parties weren't on notice and that's not within the scope of what the case is set for that day. So I think if you go to the next slide, Keith, it'll kind of break down some examples. There are certain cases that I, I don't know how your courts docket them, but these are examples of cases that par probably, if they are set on your docket for a service issue, any type of genetic testing, any type of trial, or any type of motion hearing, it's probably not going to be helpful for par to review the case for that hearing, because your recommendations are generally not going to be tailored to any of those topics. Therefore, the court's not really going to be able to, if you write a recommendation about visitation and that court hearing is set for service of a petition or a trial or paternity results, the court is not going to be able to utilize your recommendations about visitation at that hearing. So knowing what your case is for and tailoring your recommendations to fit that hearing is very important. The statutes lay out what decisions the court is gonna make at each type of hearing. And I believe if we don't have those statutes in here, I have them in another slide and I can send those out. There's a statute that specifically says what the court can decide at a dispositional hearing, what the court can decide at a permanency hearing, what the court can decide at a review hearing. Knowing what those statutes lay out will help you better tailor your recommendations. So the next slide, Keith. Can I jump in here real quick, Kim? Yeah, please do. <clears throat> so there are many ways to know which cases you're gonna review. A lot of you all um, depend on child welfare to show up with a list of cases for you to review. Um, again, there's good and bad in that. What's bad in that is you don't necessarily, they may be reviewing cases that aren't coming up for another 25 days or they got reviewed yesterday. So you don't know what's necessarily gonna be on the docket. Most, a lot of folks use the deprived docket, which I think is the best way to do that. Cause in that way, you're kind of keeping an eye on eye on what's coming up over the next 30 days for sure. The problem with that is you need to do a secondary screening with what's on this slide that Kim just talked about. Because if because that's when you're going to like when I've kind of acted as a chair in a county, I'll get a list of cases from the from the bailiff on the cases that are coming up, and then I'll remove the genetic testing ones or the service ones or the non-jury trial ones. I'll go back and thin that out. So if you're not doing that, you need to. That's another way of uh, making sure that you're not you know that you've got more time for the cases. So carry on, Kim. Thanks. 
Yeah, I think the next slide just lists cases that are obviously, um, or maybe it doesn't, but cases that you should be reviewing are things that are set for disposition. I do think, I don't know when most of your boards are starting to, uh, yeah, this is good. I don't know when most of your boards are starting to review your cases. Um, it's different in every county. I think historically the pattern has not been to review PARB. Sorry, historically the pattern has been that PARB is not reviewing cases until we get further into the case. Um, and I personally advocate the opposite. I think the earlier that PARB members start reviewing cases, the better opportunities we have to identify barriers earlier in the case. So I don't know what each of your counties call it, but statutorily it's called a disposition hearing. It should be called that in the majority of your counties. Um, I want to proffer that I think the dispositional hearing is a wonderful time for PARB to review these cases. And here's an example of why. Because at disposition, by statute, there are several decisions that the course, court must make. They must determine who gets legal custody of the children. They usually, depending on the status of, of each parent, will be entering a treatment plan, or as Barbara pointed out, the legal document you will see in the court file is, some call it, instead, is called an individualized service plan, or ISP. The ISP and the treatment plan are the same thing. So we should be entering a treatment plan for each parent in which the court has found there are conditions or problems to be fixed. A treatment plan should be entered for each child. Um, the ISP or the treatment plan must be related, as I mentioned a minute ago, to the conditions that the court found at adjudication. So by looking at the adjudication order and looking at the treatment order, you, you want to make sure that the treatment plan addresses the problems adequately. Why is it crucial that every child have a treatment plan? Because we're not just treating parents. We have to treat the trauma that the family experienced if we want to have more successful reunification. Um, I, kn I know we have limited time, so I can't go into too much, but I love to give this example. If you had a child removed from a home because of severe domestic violence, and that child is going to daycare and having difficulty, um, if hitting other child, if the child during visitation is being physically aggressive with the parent, not only to at some point make reunification successful, do we have to treat the parents for the trauma and domestic violence, but we also have to treat the child. And then we have to treat the family because mom and dad have to know how to now parent a child that is experienced this type of trauma. So let's say the child returns home in trial unification and gets angry at mom and slaps mom. So mom spanks the child. Well, we're just perpetuating that cycle of violence within that context of domestic violence. So ensuring that the treatment plan match the conditions and that each member of the family has one is crucial. Uh, we already talked about how we evaluate whether or not parents are making progress. It isn't just by checking boxes. This is another reason why reviewing a case at disposition is so important. Um, we should also determine a visitation plan for parents and just as important for siblings if siblings are separated. Again, unfortunately, I think with, um, I would love to say at some point we will have enough foster homes, but in the almost 20 years I've been doing this, we have always had a shortage of foster homes. And so it is an unfortunate reality that siblings get separated. And it is very difficult with everything going on and with the case, but it is crucial that the siblings have the opportunity to maintain a connection. So. If you're looking at all of these things that are decided at one court hearing, you can imagine that sometimes things slip through the cracks. Maybe DHS forgot to prepare a treatment plan for siblings. I'm sorry, a visitation plan. Or maybe we didn't get the treatment plans for each child completed. So this is why the earlier we look at cases, the better. And I use the disposition hearing as one example. Um, I think we can go to the next slide, Keith. 
Um, again, permanency hearing, it's limited in its scope. I do want to clarify that there are the permanency hearing and review hearings are two totally different hearings. Now, often courts will hold them simultaneously, and that is okay. And if they do, they should address everything that the statutes require for a permanency hearing and everything that the statutes require for a review hearing. But they are different, and they look at different things. So I think a permanency hearing is the most obvious. As we discussed earlier, we're looking at the permanency plan and what should it be. We're looking at whether or not the department or the state has made reasonable efforts to meet the permanency goal. A good parameter of reasonable efforts, and I like to throw this out there for your consideration, it is not a legal definition, but it has been found as like dicta in case law, meaning courts have kind of said a good parameter of reasonable efforts is whether or not DHS is assisting the family in removing barriers that prevent the child from returning home. So a good example of that may be very simply, if mom has been very successful in working her treatment plan, but still has not found housing, and we get to a permanency review, and the court asks DHS and the state, what have you done to help mom find housing? And the answer is nothing. Has the state made reasonable efforts? Questions, all things that can be evaluated by you as FARB members. So hopefully that definition very loosely might give you um, a, a framework with which to view these cases and the efforts that are being made. I think we could go to the next slide, Keith. Post dispositional review hearing, I put that because that's the title in the statute, but it's most commonly referred to as a review hearing. This hearing is where the disposition orders, so what the slide that we just talked about a few minutes ago, that's where those orders are reviewed by the court. So in a review hearing, the court shall determine whether or not the treatment plan, services, and placement are appropriate and remain in the child's best interest. They're going to look at the extent to which progress has been made correcting the conditions that brought the children into custody. It's a wonderful time to determine whether or not the ISP or services or are still adequate or if they need to be modified or clarified for any reason. Another really good example of this is if mom and dad are given a treatment plan that has substance abuse testing on it. Every county does that differently, but usually every county requires some form of it. Let's say they're testing weekly and that's written into their treatment plan. So that's the court's order. Well, let's say they've tested clean for 90 days. Is is it reasonable at the next court hearing to consider reducing the frequency of their testing? Yes. Is that a recommendation PARB can make? Yes. PARB's recommendations are not limited to the big picture. And in fact, I, when I do trainings, I often recommend that it's sometimes the little details that help make this experience in this system better for the families and children, which ultimately helps us achieve permanency quicker. Um, again, reasonable efforts. And then if a child is 14 years or older, is that child receiving independent living services? Um, so the review hearing, you notice, you don't make permanency findings. So this comes back just to tie it back again to why I recommend it, if at all possible, knowing what your case is set for on the docket so that you can tailor your recommendations to specifically address what the court will be looking at in that hearing. And all of this is laid out in statute, even though I know reading statute is like a cure for insomnia. I, I get it. As a lawyer, it, it, I totally understand, but they are a really good guideline to get you there. So, okay, I think next slide. Reunification hearing, I bring that up. Some courts do reunification hearings outside of the context of, um, they will do it via paper if there's no disagreement, but if there is a disagreement, like let's say that DHS is recommending trial reunification, but the child objects, then there will be a hearing, and that is also a great place for PARP to uh, help make recommendations that might be useful to the court. And so, um, next hearing, Keith. 
or next slide, sorry, next hearing. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about understanding what the court hearing is set for and what the court will be reviewing during that hearing, here are some tips for writing your recommendations. Um, I really want to preface this by saying that like Christina said, traditionally judges are looking at your recommendations to provide them information they didn't already know and to help them see or address issues that might have been overlooked. So do try to avoid writing questions, but it's, you've got to start somewhere and I understand that. So I always start by saying, look at what your concerns are. What is what are you or your board, depending on how you review these cases, concerned about? So let me give you an example. I, I tell myself all the time, try to use your recommendations to be your reports and your recommendations. They can be as narrow as you want them to be. They don't have to address the really or just address the really broad subjects of termination or reunification or, you know, visitation. They can be specific. But because I feel like historically PARB has tended to focus on the more broad subjects, I kind of used this recommendation, but I want to write another one that kind of narrows it as well. So let's say that DHS is recommending reunification. And after talking to DHS or reading the reports, after talking to CASA or talking to foster parents, whoever it is you talk to in the course of your review, you're concerned about that. It is not enough for PARB to just say, PARB is concerned about reunification and therefore we do not recommend it. Judges are not going to, you want judges to have a high level of confidence in why you are making a specific recommendation. Because if they don't have confidence in it, I, I fear that most of them will overlook it. So I think following a certain formula is very helpful. So the formula we recommend is stating, first formulating your concern, and there are different ways to do that. Um, and we're gonna, Keith mentioned there's checklists, there's questions, which we will be providing to you to give you a place to get started. The next is, why is that your uh, concern? So you wanna support your recommendations. Um, Keith, could you go back a slide though, real quick? I want to read that. Okay, so you formulate your concern and then you give supporting details. So example, the board was concerned about reunification. Then you want to provide your supporting details. The board is concerned about the permanency plan of reunification because the child's behaviors escalate during visitation with mom and mom has not been able to maintain sobriety for the last seven months. So those details are ones you gain during the course of your review, and they explain to the court why you are concerned about reunification. Okay, next slide. Keith, please. And then based upon your concern and based upon the facts, what is your recommendation? So the board is concerned about the permanency plan of reunification because the child's behaviors escalate during visitation and mom has not been able to maintain sobriety for the last seven months. Therefore, the board recommends termination of natural mother's rights. So again, start with your concern, support your recommendation with facts and make your recommendation a statement rather than a question. Um, I will say there are times as a side note when you are not gonna have any concerns and that's okay. Because as Keith mentioned, our theme is support, protect, monitor. So if you come across a case where you feel like things are going very well and DHS is doing very well and the child's attorney is doing very well, whatever it is, it is perfectly okay to use your recommendation to validify that. To say PARB has reviewed this case. PARB believes that all parties are, you know, uh, addressing each concern and issue as they arise. PARB is in agreement with the current track of the case good job, you know, whatever it is. It doesn't always have to point out a concern. Okay, next slide, please, Keith. Well, the next slide, I think, is we're gonna hand it over to the, the, the examples here. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, I, I, I before we went through the checklist stuff, I thought it was important, which you covered very well, Tim, um, to think through, because, you know, 
when you're writing a recommendation, you know, especially for the first time, like, well, what in the heck am I supposed to write? Well, I think Kim really helped frame that where it's like, well, the first thing is, what are you concerned about? And then the second thing is, why are you concerned about that? Um, and so some things that can help trigger that and lead with, you've developed a system over the years that's been really helpful to you. I'm trying to pull it up here, hold on. Oh, that's good, hold on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there it is. All right, Lee, you want to talk to that? And if you want me to pull up different forms, just let me know. Yeah, no, this is fine. Yeah, now, um, I probably a better title for this would be guide rather than checklist because it's really not in the form of check off each of these things as you re make do each review. But it's it's more in terms of how to think about the review and how to identify concerns that you might want to be sure are addressed. Um, the initial step section is probably more related to to us since we are able to put that information sheet inside the cover that helps save time during reviews. That may not be possible for other, other boards. But the biggest concern is, you know, the age of the child, how long they've been in out of home placement, and are they safe now? And is the parent working to make sure that they will have a safe place to which they can return? So, um, so then under the current review process, we just ask that they keep those things in mind. And we listed a few things that the parent, um, when you're thinking about the parent situation, how might you assess them? And then when you're thinking of the child situation, um, you know, how old are they? How long have they been in out of home care? And that's something that we, we put on our um, review form because I think you should keep that in mind as you're doing the review. If this child's only been out of the home six months, there hasn't been time for significant progress. But if it's already been 18 months, you know, is the parent showing a commitment to uh, addressing those safety concerns? And is the child having their needs met? Um, and then uh, in of writing the recommendations, I think keeping your audience in mind is important. Now we do ours a little differently than some others, and we do ask sometimes ask for information um, on our recommendation sheet um, because sometimes we feel that we didn't we didn't get enough updated information from DHS, or we do want a therapist report, and that would might be something that the judge would order that um, DHS hadn't done on their own, um, and, and maybe for very um, understandable reasons, but um, we, want, we want to be sure that, I think since copies of our recommendation are going to a number of different parties, we want to keep in mind our audience and that it should be inoffensive but actionable by any parties um, that that need to uh, to respond to what we're recommending, um, and I think you know as I said is uh, and, and I think that's what Kim said is even if the parent isn't ticking off all the boxes on the ISP, if they are showing progress without actually attending all that all those classes, then that's something we can consider. Um, how does the child respond to visitation? Um, is the parent putting an effort into visitation? Um, uh, and the other thing would be, if in the, looking at the situation as it is today, would we have taken the child out of the home like today? So even if everything hasn't been resolved, is the child safe if they're returned home today? If not, then what else needs to happen before that's possible? Or do we need to suggest um, pursuing another plan of permanency for this child based on how long they've been out of the home? 
So I think that, you know, rather than go item by item down this PARB reviewer, to, reviewer checklist that we use, um, people might just refer to it, see if that would um, help them in uh, just giving a guideline to their members, particularly their newer members that haven't reviewed a file and might need some additional um, guidance and suggestions. Lee, that's awesome. I mean, I, I love this, the way that you've taken the time to write this out and certainly send it out to everybody. Um, obviously, like you said, it's going to be a little bit different. I think, though, there's enough commonality in here, though, that most hard folks that have been doing this for any length of time would recognize that they follow some of the same procedures and things like that. And if you wanted to take your, I, I assume you'd be okay if they took your, your list and made some edits to, to make it more conducive to them. Yeah, I think we all have to tailor um, these suggestions to our own needs based on how we operate. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's certainly a lot of commonality things too, like I was saying, like, you know, that 11 just jumped out at me, is level of visitation or trying to communication currently allowed or being um, recommended appropriate. Um, lots of things to trigger your thinking. So if you're reviewing a case for the first time or the hundredth time, this is a good list to help you keep in mind some of the big picture items. Um, I want to show some of your other forms. Can you think of, not the recommendation yet, we'll get to that, but um, you've got a parent information form and then every county has. Yeah, um, this is, um, it's kind of hard to tell from looking at the screen uh, print, but um, this is actually an interactive um, uh, little application that we had built at, for DHS. Um, you know, the caseworkers are all really busy. We're trying to give them a more efficient tool to provide information to us. And before we did this, we were really having difficulty getting good current information. So um, I worked with the, um, the district uh, director and with um, the supervisor that attends our meetings. And this is loaded on the worker's computer. And for each case, they, uh, they load in the, the name of the, uh, the parties, the children, the parents, anybody else that is going to have an ISP or needs to be considered. And then they are um, able to input in each of these areas where the parents are complying where, or the, where they're not complying. Um, concerns, that kind of thing. And then they print them off and the supervisor brings those to our meeting. So we get a current update for each of the cases we're going to review because the supervisor knows which cases uh, we're, we're pulling that month. And then the next month when they go in on their computer, they don't have to re-enter everything that they had initially. They will just update the information with anything that's changing or any additional information. So it's kind of an efficient tool for them um, to provide information to us. And we find that we get much better information since we made this tool available to them. And it's, it's a real simple little tool. And I may be able to share the tool itself, like on a, a jump drive or something. I'd have to check that. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Or if you can send it to me, I've got Adobe Pro, I might be able to, I mean, I've got this, PDF version, but um, anyway, uh, we can talk more. But one of the things that I really like is how you've got these kind of narrative sections. I mean, I think most people use the old hard standard DHS reporting form that has a bunch of check boxes in it. If that's working for you, great. Um, I appreciate these um, kind of little narrative sections. You can say areas of, you know, things are going well, things are not going well visitation issues, resolved issues, just real quickly. Uh, anything that saves child welfare time and energy and can give you the information that you actually need is great. Uh, let's see if that's something of yours. Can you think of anything else? Oh, we already went over that. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, do you have any forms or anything else you want to share kind of on your process? 
Uh, I don't think so. Uh, the only other thing I had was when we, um, you know, when we get to some sample reviews. Right, right. I do want to save that towards the end. Well, let me go through my checklist real quick, and then Kim, you can go through your questions. So this form was created before I started. Um, I think it helps, you know, part of the training that I know Kim and I both do, we talk about identifying timing issues. You know, and so here's kind of a cheat sheet for that. Uh, adjudication as to mother 30 to 90 days, to father 30 to 90 days, if what applies, what try. ISP is supposed to be written within 60 days. So again, if you're looking at, um, you know, here's termination filed on mother, uh, children out of home 15 to 22 months. Of course, as you know, unless there's a compelling reason, which there often is. Um, but if you're just thinking or training or trying to figure out what things you should be looking for, this is a really good cheat sheet. Um, and I will um, certainly send this out as an attachment as well. And Lee, one thing you guys do, and I guess you're still doing it with the new judge, I don't know, but um, um, but with the previous judge, you certainly were. Um, you basically keep an eye on the case files. So if you see something misfiled or missigned or not signed or not closed, you would bring those to the, the attention of the court clerk and the, and the judge. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And there's one other thing I might mention is that, and we had a couple of instances of this where a case did not, we were not made aware of a case that needed to be reviewed. So we didn't even know about it. It, it came to our attention uh, by accident. So what I do, and I don't know, some others may have this ability too. We have a really good relationship with DHS in our county. So the supervisor, once or twice a year, I request that they give me a copy of their kids file that lists, just lists all the cases. And I compare it to um, an Excel file I keep on my computer to make sure that they don't have cases for children that I don't know about. And if we find that there are some, then I talk to the, um, the court about, is, is this a case for some reason we don't need to, re to review, or there are other circumstances where I can just not add it to my list. But we found over, and not many, I mean, it's only been a few over the course of many years, but you hate, one of my big concerns would be that a, a child falls through the cracks because nobody them. And, and I'm sure DHS is taking care of them, but we're not overseeing them and performing our role if we don't in, aren't informed that that case even exists. So I'm um, so glad you brought that up. I mean, I, I hear you that that doesn't happen very often, but it's also, if you look at the original statute, the reason PARB was created is to make sure that kids don't get lost in the system. Well, that means you need to cross-reference your case list and make sure that they don't. So if yeah. you're just if you're just following the, the bailiff's um, docket list, you're not going to pick up the ICPC, the interstate compact list, because that case is not the court case is not in that county. That court case is going to be in some other county or some other state. That child welfare is still looking at that case so we're supposed to keep an eye on those cases too so i don't know if that makes sense but um so you I, you do have to and it's i know it's time consuming you don't have to do it every month necessarily but every once in a while cross-referencing your child welfare list against your um your docket list um and lee was there anything else you checked to kind of make sure you didn't miss anybody um i don't think so i think that was that was it okay just just keep that in mind you um want to try to keep an eye out and it could be a paperwork issue too but boy you'd hate for someone to be stuck in foster care forever just because someone didn't file a piece of paper um all right kim um you you want to go over these um i basically these are your questions taken straight out of your powerpoint training yeah, and no, I don't think we need to go through. If they were just another resource, I, I will tell you, I it's things I've just you know grabbed here and there as I've seen them. Again, they are just questions to basically kick off your 
hey, formulate, if you're struggling with what, where to start, or questions to ask to help you narrow down um, concerns in the case. These questions are just examples uh, to get you thinking. Um, I really love Lee's um, questions. I, I think they're fabulous. I, I think they're probably even a little bit more relevant and easier than these, but I've had these for a while and I always hand them out to new volunteers and say, hey, if you're struggling with, with where to start, these are some great questions to ask. In Tulsa County, our review process is a little bit different. I assign the cases Keith was saying several weeks in advance, and then our volunteers actually um, interview DHS, they interview CASA, they interview the travel worker, and hopefully the foster parent. Um, we we have a really pretty good success rate of that in Tulsa County, and I and I'm super excited. I will tell you that. Um, I think foster parents are one of our, which is very sad, but I think they're one of our most untapped resources in these cases. Um, they are, you know, essentially raising these children every single day, and they have a lot of, of information. They have a lot of insight, um, you know, and information. I think that if it's at all possible to find a way to incorporate foster parents information into your reviews, um, you know, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, I can't tell you how many problems we've solved. Um, and Sarah, Harry, oh, hi, Sarah. She just asked a question. Uh, what would you say is the best way for a foster parent to get a hold of their local PAR? I will let Keith answer that. I know for Christina and I, it's contacting us directly uh, via email, but if they don't know their local chair, I know Keith has it and Keith can absolutely put you in touch with the local chair. Is that fair, Keith? Yeah, very much. I have a list of chairs and Sarah, I can certainly send it out, send it out to anybody who, who wants it. Um, keep in mind, um, there, I think to involve foster parents takes a little bit of some coordination and some culture shift. I don't think any part member would mind or would they probably love to have foster parent voice at the at their meeting. But if they're reviewing 30 or 40 cases, it's hard to have 30 or 40 foster parents at that meeting, not to mention not to mention um, um, typically the part volunteer is not going to know who the foster parents are unless they get that from child welfare and typically child welfare would have to reach out on behalf of Barb to invite them to meet and to get a hold of the report so it takes some initial it takes some initial conversation and discussion it does and it depends on how your board is structured but if if there is a way to incorporate that i, I would say that if you walk away today with a goal that is uh, for your board after this training, like, hey, I want to try this or I want to do this, I think including foster parents is is a wonderful goal. Uh, like he said, you can request the information from the DHS workers. Uh, if you get your case assignment in advance from your local chair, and I know some of you do not, but if you do, that is a great opportunity to reach out to DHS to get foster parent information. There are several forms that PARB has, I know DHS uses as well, that allows a foster parent to basically provide information to the court and parties. Maybe they're most commonly called a foster parent court report, but there's foster parent information forms. Um, those can be utilized by your PARB board. Uh, we're trying to work really hard to get the word out to foster parents about PARB, just because I know one of the one of the only barriers that I hit in Tulsa County with our volunteers reaching out to foster parents is sometimes they don't know who we are. And so they're hesitant to have a conversation. But if you can incorporate them, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and Keith is a great way to brainstorm that in your county. And I'm willing to help you too. I know Christina is as well. So that's it on my checklist. I don't know that it's it's. I, I would start with Lee's, but if you if you need some more resources, I think it's it might be helpful and it's broken down by, you know, questions to ask pertaining to each type of hearing that you might be having. Yeah, um, and I've gotten a few just back on the foster parent subject real quick um, because of this outreach the, and you know, our great connection with Sarah and, and the Foster Care and Adoptive Association and that great partnership. I've gotten some calls about, you know, hey, um i want my i want my case reviewed by the local part board um well for one thing we're not statewide unfortunately 
Um, and I always try to help them understand the expectations. At the end of the day, Barb will be making a recommendation to the judge. And then at that point, it's what the judge wants to do. So managing those expectations is can be a challenge too. But, and, but they get that if you just remind them of that. Um, anyway, that, that's great. Let me share one more while I've got the mic here. Um, Christina just recently did one for her Indian show. So, I was staring right at it. There it is. So, what she did, and Christina, I'm sure you can speak for yourself after I'm done speaking for you, <laughs> um, is basically just, you know, thought through okay, when we have, oh, I'm sorry, it was transitions, not Indian show welfare, sorry. It would work for any child welfare too. Like, you know, you tend to end up asking the same questions in every meeting if you're looking at a certain group or a certain, you know, whatever. So she just started writing those down. So, um, Christina, anything you want to say about that? Well, um, well uh, that was just a rough <laughs> draft. So. No. I mean, just when it comes to the, to the youth, you know, 14 and older, you want to make sure that OXA services have been initiated. Uh, they do their, their very first um, plan for my future at 14, and then it's upgraded every year. So you want to make sure, you know, that they're uh, aware of that. Uh, service and what it means uh to to the youth i mean it it's basically i don't know you caught me by surprise keith <laughs> i know sorry well my my main my main point in just bringing it up is to show how easy it is to just start writing some of the same questions you ask at every meeting so that you can that's a good way to train somebody um, Lee, I'm not sure how you started your list, but I imagine it was someone like that. You probably realized you're asking the same questions over and over and then you start writing them down. Um, so I'm going to actually, Jim, for the last couple of slides, I'm going to make you a moderator. So, all right, you got yours ready to open? I, me? Yes. Yes. I think so. Well, hold on. Well, I'll just do it. I'll just pull it back up. Okay. Um, I was going to run to the bathroom, but I guess I'll just wait. <laughs> well, and I, I do want to point out real briefly, it's a, it's a conversation for a whole nother day and a whole nother training. There was recently a lot of changes in federal statutes regarding services available to children 14 years older and older, and particularly now after they age out. Um, DHS can now provide services up to children who were in custody at the time of turning 18 up to 27 years old. You're talking rental assistance, applicant. There is so much. Uh, I think OAKSA is one of the most underutilized or un underknown, I would say, programs. Um, and so as a it's something I'm looking at doing a training. Uh, we have a rep, but just know OAKSA is a, a huge umbrella and it's very beneficial to those kiddos that you have that are older and not uh, even if they're in a permanent placement there's plenty of services available to them or particularly if they are not in a permanent placement so okay writing the recommendation is people go ahead and laugh that i put this slide in there because probably 99 percent of it's common sense but um it is crucial just as little tips to be legible if you're handwriting these uh, to try your best, I think I lost it, Keith. The slideshow went away on your screen and I can't see it on mine. There we go. Um, clearly document your recommendations. I know this is going to sound funny, but instead of one long, big paragraph, um, you know, I always recommend starting with the facts that you've found during your review that you rely on to make your recommendations and then 
spacing down, indenting, and then writing your recommendations. Writing it in a manner, whether it be typewritten or handwritten, that you can clearly see uh, and read what you are writing. Um, be brief, be accurate, be professional, watch your spelling and punctuation. Um, most importantly, I just advise, because I've practiced in front of a lot of judges, uh, be advisory and try not to dictate uh, to the court. Um, I think it comes off better when we temper our language in a manner that uh, tell, you know, recommends, PARB recommends this for the following reasons, period, instead of terminate parental rights, period, or order visitation, period. Um, do not restate the history of the case. That's one thing that I have seen prior in prior part reports that I think sometimes, uh, you know, will create parties and judges to kind of quit reading halfway through it if they feel like they're reading the same thing over and over and over because Remember, yours is not the only recommendation that the court is getting um, at that time. They're probably going to get a DHS report. They're probably going to get a PERB or, or, I'm sorry, a cost report if they're involved. So no need to restate the history of the case. Okay, you can skip to the next one. Keith, if there isn't it. Okay. Um, I like this slide, though, because I think it's good reminders. Documenting expressed concerns by the parties is it's absolutely okay, especially if those parties don't necessarily have a strong role in the proceedings. So I go back to, um, I love to use the foster parent example. Some foster parents don't even, aren't even aware of when a court hearing is, unfortunately. They should be, but they're not always. So I found sometimes foster parents have a lot of crucial information that they'll provide to our volunteers. And even if it doesn't ultimately end up recommending being a recommendation part by part, it's still okay to document that concern. Parb talk, uh, spoke with foster mom, period. Foster mom reports that the child is having frequent night terrors, period. Even if you're not gonna follow that up with a recommendation, which I of course would, such as Parb would recommend court order the appropriate therapy to address the night terrors the child's housing or whatever it is, uh, that your recommendation is, but it's also it's also okay just to document those. I said it earlier. I'm going to say it again. Little things matter. Um, I think we're often trained to think that to look at big issues like placement and permanency. And don't get me wrong, you should. But it's the little details that sometimes can make the experience in foster care better for these children and families. For example, if a child's been placed in three different foster homes and they've moved schools and they have an IEP. What is the likelihood that that IEP is getting transferred appropriately and timely in each case? Very minimal. But is an IEP crucial to a child's ongoing education and how the school educates that child? Yes. So I love to use that example. Um, it is important to know, as we stated the background of the case, but it is not PARB's role to reinvestigate. So, and that kind of goes with the one below, which I mentioned earlier as well. You do need to understand the history and the dynamics of the family and the decisions previously made, but you shouldn't spend your time and energy looking at fault and error in those prior decisions. It doesn't do any good to point out that you know, the prior visitation schedule was inappropriate. It does do good to make recommendations about what that visitation schedule should look like moving forward based upon the information that you've come across. Okay. All right, awesome. We covered a lot of information. That's the formal part. Um, and just FYI, I wanted you all to know, I will, we have a fillable um, two page, if you want to use both pages, um, recommendation form, I'll include that and in what I email out. Um, and anytime you want to talk about forms or something that might help serve your purposes better, please give me a call. Uh, obviously, you know, might start with Kim in Tulsa County and Christine in Oklahoma County, but, but for all the rest of you, I'm your guy. So. Um, let me know and we'll, we'll talk about it. So with that, uh, let me, um, let's, let's open it up for questions or thoughts.
Keith. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was interested. Well, it is all very good. I appreciate you having this today and hearing from uh, both of the speakers. Um, I've had an issue not too long ago of finding out that there were cases that uh, we have not been reviewing. And in both cases, they were sent in from other counties. And when I I always contact the uh, uh, the court clerk for the juvenile clerk to get my list, and uh, I've never had her add anything on from another county. So I I really was upset that we have some that we've two of them that I know of that have that's happened and we have not reviewed. So we're we're mending that at the moment, but. Uh, what was the, would you tell me again, um, what the, the supervisor list, was it a, uh, that I might contact? I, I just need to find some way to make sure I have all of those cases. Well, there's, there's two lists. There's, um, what the judge is going to be going over, um, on their docket, you know, have, you know, some judges meet, you know, have their deprived docket twice a week, some do it once a week, some do it twice a month. Um, but whatever the case, they're going to have their bailiff, or in other words, their secretary, is going to have a list of the cases that are coming up. So that's, I think, your number one list to look at. Okay. Um, and um, then, which sounds like I think, Phil, when you get that. Um, and then, you know, you might, in addition, talk to DHS to get their list. Um, so when you were, and I don't know, maybe you and I should talk, talk later. When we're talking about out of county, I'm wondering if that falls under the jurisdiction of another card board. Um, well, we have, yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, you know, we sh apparently we should have been reviewing them because we have part of the cases there and then they were actually moved, the case was moved in to Osage County. So from, I think, Washington County. So, but I, you know, I never knew about that. So right. it just got right. dropped through the cracks. Sure. Well, that, that happens. Um, a lot of workers move around. A lot of workers are from different counties. Um, yeah. Other, yeah. other uh, thoughts, questions? Keith, um, the DHS is able to run a report on their kids system that just lists all the files with, um, and you, you can have as little or as much information as you want. So I've asked them to pare it down to just what I need. But that's what I use to compare to what I have. And it took them a little while to figure out how to do it. But once they did, then it's not a problem to get it whenever I need it. Good. Well, that's definitely another quick way to get like uh, who the worker is and who, you know, when the next review hearing is. All that stuff that's hard to flip through the case file to get. If you can get a spreadsheet from your child welfare staff that's or a supervisor and like i said before i'm going to make it real clear if you have certain workers that come to your meeting and you've had a great relationship with them for years great i'm not asking you to change who comes to your meeting necessarily but i want you to at least know the name and the phone number and have gone to lunch with or somehow have some sort of um relationship with the district director because they're going to they've got the most power and they're going to be the most consistent and they can tell you that, you know, gee, I'd really, I've got this new supervisor. I'd really prefer that they attend the PAR board meeting. Um, anyway, my thoughts on that. Any other questions or thoughts? And like I said, I will, I've gotten a couple slides about getting information. And I will send out a group email to everybody that attended this training. And then you feel free to forward to any of your members or anybody that you feel would be helpful. I I apologize, Keith, that my uh, screen hasn't been on, but I just wanted to thank you guys for um, being a part of this and just being a part member. I am a foster parent, but I'm um, also the executive director of the Foster Association, like Keith was mentioning. And if you need any anything from us access to our foster families maybe some strategy on how to tap into that resource please feel free to, to reach out to me i'll put my contact information in the chat um but i know that foster parents have a plethora of information helpful 
information for these cases and they they do have the details that Kim was talking about the details of this case and so we certainly want to be a value and and, and not a, um, a hindrance in your processes but we certainly we just need to know how to connect with you all because yeah every county I know is is going to be a slightly different. So if you if you want our foster parents to email you, great. If you want to contact them, great. But um, be thinking what you know what is the best for your county, and and then maybe reach out to me, and I can get the information to our families. Awesome, awesome. You're a great partner, Sarah. We we appreciate you, and all the foster parents you work with. All right. Anybody else? You know, again, I, I know I said it once, I want to say it again. Please, please come away from this being energized, not depressed. You may not be looking at this same level of information in your local part board. It's okay. Maybe um, take a couple of these, you know, kind of checklists or review questions. The next meeting, say, hey, I attended this meeting. You know, here's something that might be useful you keep an eye on. Just showing up, keep an eye on these cases and keeping everybody honest is, is, is the most important step and the biggest step. And then the more sophisticated we get beyond that, it just only helps that much more. So, all right, with that soapbox, I guess I will log off as always. Um, Christina and Kim and I just wanna, um, wanna be here to help. So, hold on a second. Um, Look at the notes again. Okay, good, good, good. This compliments. Okay. <laughs> and Sarah put her phone number in there, and I'll probably put her email in. If I'm sure she wouldn't mind if you put her phone number in. I'll put her email in the email that I send out to everybody. All right. Well, not hearing any other comments or thoughts, I guess we'll go ahead and end it for the day. Um, just um, the the I'm real excited about the. Um, the field trip we're doing in Oklahoma County at the Juvenile Justice Center on the 17th. And you don't have to be from Oklahoma County to attend that, um, but it's going to be in Oklahoma County. That's not going to be virtual. Um, we're going to look at the Juvenile Justice Center, um, meet with uh, Judge Stinson, see the family tree, and get a tour of the detention center. Um, and then we are going to be um, having our creating a database for our recommendation forms. We've got a training coming up on how to do that as well. Um, so keep an eye out. Hope I don't inundate you too much with emails and uh, have a good week.